For him, as for us, the marvelous moment of flight, and the spirit of chivalry that hovered in aerial combat, translated into a sense of endless happiness and peace of mind. The constant nearness of death adds spice to life while it lasts. Dedicated to fighting for the interests of the motherland, we can enjoy the simple fact of our existence with genuine admiration. Simply because life is so unpredictable and beautiful, we view it like a bottle of exquisite Rinvain, with a sense of urgency to savor it to the last drop while we have the opportunity, draining the bottle to the bottom in an atmosphere of cheerful festivity. When we weren't in the air, Furman could be around the airfield, in the hangars, in the mess hall. He was just there. No one paid much attention to him, but when he left, there was a vague feeling as if something was missing. He was seen as a background element. He rarely opened his mouth, but even when he did say something, no one listened to him. Once, when we were talking about him, about how quiet he was, one of the girls remarked that there were devils in a quiet pool. She smiled furtively. She must have known what she was talking about. When the game was over, the excited noise that had reigned at the beginning was replaced by a tense silence. Furman continued to win until the very end. Then he contentedly placed six 100-mark bills in his wallet and lovingly, with a smile, added two five-franc coins. Then he returned to his usual place somewhere in the back. At noon today we set off on our return journey. There was no change in the weather. When we landed, Furman was gone. He had fallen behind us again. His plane gradually lost altitude until it disappeared into the cloud cover. I reported to the base that we had lost him, and in the evening the search began. We waited for a long time without any result. It got dark. The phone rang. News about Furman. Comrades watched as I nervously grabbed the receiver. There's been a disaster in the Ems Moor area. Someone from the peasants found the wreckage of the wings and tail of an airplane. The engine, cockpit, and pilot's body had sunk into a rippling, bottomless swamp. Among the pile of mangled metal, the rescue team found scraps of overalls and a wallet. In the wallet were six 100-mark bills and two five-franc coins. Furman. The comrades, shocked, looked at me. I have the feeling that the future always brings some kind of loss. November 23, 1943. Today at noon came the news that Captain Dolinga crashed. On the wall of the pilot's room we hung his picture, next to pictures of our fallen comrades. Under each portrait in block letters were written the rank, name, and date of death. Some are signed, sometimes with a humorous dedication. Sergeant Volney, Lieutenant Steiger, Non-Commissioned Officer Kolb, Lieutenant Gerhard, Sergeant Kramer, Sergeant Delling, Lieutenant Killian, Sergeant Furman. Who's next? No one stays at the top, Steiger wrote in his characteristic scribbles. We knew exactly what the big red-haired man meant when he wrote that under the smiling portrait. A thousand takeoffs imply a thousand landings. Somehow the landing happens, one way or another. But someday it will be the last time. It's a good thing we didn't find him. I can't stand the sight of corpses. That's Baron. He and Furman had been inseparable friends for years. He sat with his legs spread wide and stared at his friend's portrait unable to bear the thought of his death. He didn't complain, he didn't ask for sympathy, he found an outlet for his grief, mutedly grumbling that of all men it was Furman who should be buried at the bottom of the northern swamp. Baron is, of course, right in what he says about corpses, we all know exactly what he means. It's a feeling not easy to put into words. Every feature of our comrades' faces and every character trait is close to us. We remember their gestures, their gait, their voice, their laughter, even when they are not with us. The mutilated body does not match the image of the comrade preserved in our memory. This terrible phenomenon repels us. Therefore, we avert our eyes so as not to poison the memory of our good comrade, not to destroy the image stored in our memory by looking at the mortal remains. No, we will not look. We love life. What death has done should not be part of our world. Besides, they're not really dead. Dieter, Dolenga, Furman, Steiger, Kolb, and the rest. 
It's just that they are no longer with us. They are gone. God has taken them to himself. That's February 28, 1943. All night, Lieutenant Gervard, and I sat in my room. The Americans are giving us a lot of trouble. We were pondering what to do about them. Dieter came up with a great idea. Why not bomb the dense American formation, using our planes as bombers? All night we calculated the speed and trajectories and came to the same conclusion. The desired result can be achieved by simultaneously dropping bombs with all the link on a dense formation of American bombers. This could be followed by a conventional attack using our conventional capabilities. The Messerschmitt 100 and 9G is capable of carrying a load of 500, 250 kilograms, pounds. So each plane can take 517, 150 kilograms, old bombs or one 500 pounds bomb, or a bunch of small fragmentation bombs, the kind I dropped on Ivan's heads in Russia. We need a 15 second fuse. The altitude for effective bombing is 1000 meters. In the morning, I reported our plan to the commander. He thought it was a joke and laughed. But our serious arguments convinced him, and he agreed to support our plan at division headquarters. In the evening, having previously warned the commander, I flew to the division headquarters and stayed. Stayed. General Schwabedison, 19, and Colonel Henschel, commander of Fighter Aviation Division, listened to my report and agreed to help. I then submitted for approval a petition to provide us with 100 100-pound training bombs, bomb-throwing mechanisms for all types of bombs, means for loading bombs into the aircraft. In addition, I requested that we be given an airplane for one hour a day to tow a target, preferably a U-88. This airplane, traveling at the same speed as the Boeing, would carry the target, which we would aim at. My requests were immediately granted. Colonel Henschel did not leave the telephone until we had everything we needed. We will take every opportunity to work out every detail in the coming days. March 8, 1943. 48 hours after my visit, three heavy trucks with training bombs arrived at division headquarters. Everything else was delivered to us this morning. In the meantime, the squadron has been conducting drills every day. All my pilots are very talented and experienced so soon we have already mastered the necessary maneuvers. Now we can fly wing to wing, stable, as a single structure. Each maneuver is performed clearly and accurately, including synchronized landing of a group of aircraft. For combat purposes, my squadron has been allocated from the squadron as a separate tactical unit to deal with large groups of enemy aircraft. I was even allocated my own system, in the evening dieter and I dropped the first training bombs on a target towed by a Ju-88. The results were far from perfect. March 10, 1943. Today we practiced bombing at Swishinon all day. The results are excellent. March 12, 1943. The first batch of live bombs arrived. Now the link is ready to fulfill new tasks. March 16, 1943. Our mechanics are working like hell, loading the bombs into the airplane as fast as possible. They are trying very hard, and I am pleased with their enthusiasm. They are really good guys. March 18, 1943. In the morning dieter, and I dropped four 100-pound training bombs each on a target. My third bomb hit exactly in the bullseye. Without any warning, at 2.12 p.m., the order came in for a combat sortie. We are to attack and intercept heavy bombers approaching the coast. We don't have time to load the bombs. Before closing the hatch, Dieter told me that he wanted to shoot down the lead man in the bomber formation today. I, laughing, asked if the Yanks paint insignia on the wings of their planes. At an altitude of 8,000 meters near Heligoland, we met the enemy. I led the wing in a tight formation in a frontal attack. I opened fire on a Liberator just below me. It immediately caught fire and veered to the right of the formation, crashing down. I went in again to attack from the tail, then conducted another frontal attack, shooting the falling liberator from the front and from below. Never before had I had such a convenient target. Suddenly, it exploded and flinging debris rained down on my head. 
For a few minutes I was in danger of colliding with the falling engine, or the spinning, flaming wings. That would mean disaster for me. It was necessary to act as quickly as possible, and I began to dive downward. The fuselage of the Liberator passed only a few centimeters from me. The plane fell into the sea thirty kilometers southeast of Heligoland. This is my fifth. I climbed to an altitude of eight thousand meters for the next attack. Suddenly, my heart almost stopped. Dieter is right in the middle of the Yankee formation, following the same course. The first Liberator he shot down crashed down a few minutes ago. Now he's about to send the lead American into the North Sea. The guy seems to have lost his mind. He keeps right at the tail of the Boeing 20, firing ceaselessly. Tracer rounds are hitting him. He's completely out of his mind. I dive down, making my way to Dieter through the formation of Americans, firing indiscriminately at all the nearest airplanes. Suddenly Dieter's plane began to drop sharply. A tail of smoke trailed behind him. He opened the hatch and jumped out. His parachute opened. I flew next to him. Dieter's face twisted in pain, and he wrapped his arms around himself. It looked like Dieter was hurt. Fifteen minutes later, he fell into the sea in the sector marked on the map as UR-9. He managed to free himself from his parachute. His rubber boat inflated, and he climbed into it. I flew right over him and waved at him. He didn't respond. He seemed to be seriously injured, apparently in the abdomen. I immediately radioed the crash site of our downed comrade and asked for help for him, then returned to base. The mechanics were shocked at the news. My own success brought me no joy. Only if Dieter could be rescued in time. I headed for the sea alone. The others haven't returned yet. I can't find Dieter. I hoped that one of the patrol ships noticed the falling parachutist and rushed to help. It's nightfall. Still no news of Lieutenant Gerhardt. I found a bottle of cognac in his locker. The same bottle is in my locker. Once he and I had agreed that if one of us did not return from a mission, the other would get these bottles and together with the guys would commemorate the deceased. What happened to Dieter? At midnight, the phone rang in my apartment. Lieutenant Dieter Gerhardt was found by the crew of the U.S. Falk. He's dead. I slowly hung up the phone. Dieter is dead. He was my closest friend. I took the bottle from the cupboard and went to Lieutenant Frey's house. He, along with his wife, Lilo had stopped by to visit them. They too were waiting with great anxiety for news of Dieter. When I entered, they guessed everything without words. I handed the bottle to Frey. We should honor him. We all feel the same way. But since we made such an agreement with Dieter, we must keep our promise. March 19, 1943 Dieter's body was brought to Cuxhaven and laid to rest in the morgue of the hospital there. I made a huge wreath. My boys put it in the Fieseler storage, on which I am going to fly to Dieter. I'm flying over Jadebusen, over the wide mouth of the Weser. The water glistens like a mirror, smooth and calm, reflecting the rays of the rising sun. To the north stretched the sea, from where the body of my dead friend had been delivered. I landed in a small field not far from the hospital and carried the wreath to a small church. There, in the center of a white small cold room, lies Dieter, covered with a white blanket. Somebody threw back the blanket. The beautiful slender fellow lies cold and peaceful. It is as if he is asleep, relaxed after a fierce fight and fall. His eyes are closed. The defiance is still there in his features. Sleep well, Dieter. You earned your rest by fighting and dying for our beloved fatherland. You were my best friend. I will never forget you. I am left alone, but I will continue to fight for Germany in this great battle we started together. You and I, faithful to the oath we took. March 22, 1943, 2.24 p.m., the siren wailed. Damn it. Once again, we don't have time to load the bombs. The Americans are approaching from the north flying over the sea. They're gathered as usual in the same sector of Dora Dora, over Yarmouth. A few minutes later we received orders to return. The enemy planes have turned back and are heading west. Will they return? After landing the planes are immediately refueled, 
The pilots are waiting for a new alert. The enemy's intentions are not clear as they are constantly changing course. I try to load a 500-pound bomb into my plane as quickly as possible. At this time, the order to take off comes in, but I am not yet ready. Eschit. Wenikers, take command. I relayed the order. Wenikers waved his hand. He understood me and started to run down the runway. The others followed him. In close formation, the formation took to the air. Sweaty mechanics work feverishly under the belly of my Gustav. I buckled in, sit in the cockpit, and impatiently smoking. Come on, come on, faster, faster. My comrades disappeared from sight, heading toward the sea. The Yankees have crossed the coast of Holland. Done. My overloaded plane, rumbling, rolled to the far end of the runway. With a bomb, I can't launch into the wind. During the turn, my plane suddenly began to lurch to the left. A tire burst. I fired a red flare. My men realized what was wrong. Twenty or thirty men climbed into the truck, which rushed toward me. The left fender was propped up by strong backs. The tire was replaced within seconds. I didn't even turn off the engine. It's all right. They scattered. I started to fan out, but the airplane tilted to the left again. Despite this, I tried to climb. After 200 meters I took off, passing a few centimeters above the roof of the second hangar. I am climbing at full speed into the cloudless sky, heading for the sea. Above my head I can see the exhaust traces of our and American airplanes. A battle has already broken out here. 7,000 meters. My plane is barely moving with an incredibly heavy load. I barely made it to 10,000 meters in 25 minutes. The Yanks have bombed Wilhelm Shaven, as far as I can tell from the smoke and fires below. They are coming back through Heligoland. I moved slowly forward until I was over the forward machine of an enemy formation composed entirely of Boeings. For several minutes I found myself under fire from below, while with great difficulty I tried to aim, tilting one wing and the other to see the enemy planes below. Two or three holes appeared on my left wing. I lit the fuse, took final aim, and dropped the bomb. It went down. Turning sideways, I watched it fall. It exploded right in the center of the bomber formation. One car had a wing torn off, two more were thrown aside. Fifty kilometers west of Heligoland, my third heavy bomber crashed into the sea. There was no sign of fire. It was followed by its torn off wing, falling swaying like an autumn leaf. The bomb had hit its target. This hit created a furor among the high command as well. Immediately after landing, I was required to report to the commander of our wing. He himself was in the air at the same time as me and watched the fall of the Boeing. My God, Noke, you must do it again with your whole wing. I intend to do so, Mr. Commander. Do you think it will work? Frankly, I wasn't very confident of success. Maybe I was just lucky today, but maybe we'll be able to shoot down more of these babies this way. Later, Colonel Henschel called. I am delighted, my dear Noak. That was marvelous. I want to congratulate you. He fairly bleated and seemed excited. I hope his monocle didn't fall into his cocoa cup from excitement. The aviation of the German North Sea coast had gotten its sensation. The latest excitement was waiting for me at our airfield. To me this excitement about one down bomber seems rather absurd. First of all, that bomb could have been dropped by anyone. Secondly, it wasn't my idea, it was dieters. Third, I have eight holes in my airplane. During the night, I was awakened by a phone call. It was the switchboard. You have a call from Air Force Command. What? Me? I said my name. On the other end of the line was a major from Reichsmarschall Göring's staff. Did you shoot down an enemy plane today by dropping a bomb on it? Yes, Herr Major. He began to question me in detail. What type of bomb? What kind of fuse? How accurately was the attack calculated? What was the result? Who gave the order for the bombing? No one, Mr. Major. I acted on my own initiative. There was silence on the other end of the line. 
My first thought was that I had not received an order to drop such a large egg on the heads of the unfortunate Yankees, and that it might be regarded as highly impermissible arbitrariness. At this time, the Major returned to the line. I am connecting you with the Reichsmarschall. I had the biggest shock of my life. I petrified, lying on the bed, and reported. Lieutenant Nock, commander of the 5th Wing of the 1st Air Group. I am very impressed with your actions. I want to personally express to you my appreciation. That's it. Thus we got a newly fledged Prussian lieutenant of the German Air Force talking to his commander-in-chief lying on his bed, wearing only a pajama jacket. Unbelievable. If the old man could see. I wasn't even wearing underwear, the tightness irritating me. I couldn't keep from laughing at the thought. March 23, 1943. I was told that the experimental station at Recklin called last night. They asked me to send them a full report immediately. Good God, I wish I hadn't shot down that bomber. At 10 o'clock General Cam Huber 21 called. This disgusting little boar, known as Dwarf, is the commander of the 12th Air Corps. I got a beating for my behavior yesterday. He's furious. I had to hold the phone at arm's length. Where do you think we'll be if every lieutenant does whatever the hell he wants? Came his angry voice. What the hell do you think you're doing? I knew this question would come up. It comes up in our services every time a superior officer runs out of eloquence when he reprimands you. He expects me to admit that I couldn't resist playing with bombs because I enjoy watching them explode. Do you have anything to say for yourself? Of course I can. Yes, Mr. General. The Reichsmarschall called me last night and personally commended my initiative. Busted. It alarmed the dwarf. I heard him exhale noisily. What is honey for one is poison for another, as the old German proverb says. Colonel Lutzo, inspector of the Air Force Command, arrived by airplane in the evening. The tall young colonel is one of our most celebrated fighter pilots, and among his decorations is the Knight's Cross with Swords. He enjoys great popularity, which he has earned by his friendliness. Simply and openly he discussed with me the possibilities involved in bombing flying airplanes. As an experiment, it was decided that one of the links of the 26th Fighter Air Group, based on the coast near the English Channel, will conduct a bombing raid on American. Bombers 22. We are both convinced that in any case, this tactic cannot be used for long. The Americans will send bombers accompanied by fighters. What a fuss over such a trifle, Mr. Colonel. I'm already regretting shooting down that plane. Lutzo laughed. Me too. April 17, 1943. Today the Americans attacked Bremen. We went up to intercept, loaded with bombs, which we dropped when the formation flew in tight formation over the center of Bremen. Not a single bomb hit the target. We immediately went on the attack, using machine guns. I attacked the Boeing three times, and eventually it caught fire. Southwest of Bremen, in a field near Bassum, it crashed. Five crew members jumped out with parachutes. My comrades shot down three other airplanes. May 14, 1943. The enemy is bombing Kiel. We rushed to him, loading bombs. Several times we undertook a collective attack at an altitude of 10,000 meters above Holstein. Each time the enemy planes eluded us. Obviously, they knew of our intentions. Over Kiel we came under heavy fire from our anti-aircraft guns. Unfortunately, the sailors fired so well that we were completely disorganized. I watched the Yankees bombing. They dropped their bombs precisely on the Germania shipyard. I am impressed with the precision with which these scum are working. Fantastic. I had a chance to carry out my plan, so I gathered everyone together to finish the job. My bomb didn't go off, but Sergeants Furman 23, Fest 24 and Beerman 25 managed to hit. Three six owing destroyed in the air. Relying on my machine guns and cannons, I went into a frontal attack on a separate group of 30 Boeing. Almost immediately I felt a hit to my fuselage and had to abandon the attack. My engine is running smoothly. Instruments show that everything is normal. I made another attack. 
my first salvo hit the cockpit of the Boeing. It floundered like a mortally wounded animal and veered sharply to the right. At an altitude of about 10,000 meters, its wing broke off. It crashed near Guzum at 12.17. I returned with several holes in the fuselage and tail. Today my squadron shot down five bombers. The total number of bombers we shot down reached 50, and the 50th was shot down by Iskid. Wenikers. Thus my fifth link shot down more bombers than the staff officers, fourth and sixth links combined. During an inspection of the squadron this evening, General Holland, Commander, Fighter Aviation, left an entry in the Book of Honor expressing his best wishes and congratulations on our 50th baby. May 15, 1943. The Americans repeated the attack on Kiel today. I can only get five planes in the air as almost all of our planes have significant damage. We met the enemy planes off Street Peter Peninsula before they reached the mainland. Only one of our bombs, dropped by Sergeant Leonard's 26, hit the target. One of the Boeings crashed down. I twice unsuccessfully tried to attack one of the groups of enemy aircraft. The Americans used the wave flight tactic. This makes a frontal attack very difficult because the target is in the crosshairs for three to four seconds. Timing is very important because of the frantic final speed. Our speed is added to the enemy's speed at 8,000 meters and totals over 1,000 kilometers per hour. Finally, I managed to reach the Boeing flying on the outside of the formation. I saw that I had hit the right inner engine. But the Boeing simply moved inland into the well-defended center of the formation. The next frontal attack had no effect. I barely managed to avoid collision with the huge tail of one of the Americans. Its rudder alone was equal in size to the entire wingspan of my Mi-109. It was one of those days when everything goes to hell. I'd lost sight of the Boeing I'd hit. I couldn't wait any longer. I ducked steeply into the tail of another Boeing. Finally, my attacks had an effect. The two left engines are on fire. The Yankee is rapidly losing speed. He's already behind his own. It's over. I came in from the tail again, firing all my weapons. Tongues of flame appeared at the bottom of the fuselage. All ten crew members jumped out with parachutes. The parachute seemed in the sky like laundry hung on an invisible rope. Meanwhile, the giant airplane plummeted downward, leaving a long trail of smoke spinning uncontrollably and finally disintegrated in midair. It crashed at 10.56 in the sector marked on the map as Tony Siegfried 4, May 18, 1943. Apart from fighting American bombers, we continue to escort naval convoys. Thus, I made my 200th combat sortie, May 19, 1943. At 13.40, I shot down my seventh heavy bomber. In the evening, an enemy scout flying at high altitude was spotted. Over Heligoland, it slipped away from me. I could not pinpoint it. It seemed to be a lightning. June 1, 1943. The Americans are again approaching over the sea. In the first attack over Heligoland, the engine of my airplane is badly damaged, as is the fuel pump. We had just taken up a position convenient for bombing. I was forced to get off my egg, after which I miraculously made it to the base. Sergeant Kramer was also hit over Van Drugge. His machine, with its tail completely torn off, lost control and collided in midair with Lieutenant Bierman's machine. The two airplanes clashed for a few seconds and began to fall almost plumb. Then Berman somehow leveled his mangled plane and was able to glide to the airfield. He went for a hard landing, but the speed was too great and he flipped over. The airplane was completely destroyed and Bierman was unharmed. Kramer jumped out with a parachute. He lost his cool and tried to open his parachute at over 900 kilometers per hour. Two slings on the parachute broke and it opened halfway. Kramer fell into the sea, was pulled out and sent to the hospital. He was spitting blood. June 11, 1943. The Americans didn't show up until this evening. We went up to intercept them twice, only on the second time, when the bombers were flying over the sea, returning home. I got a chance to get into a comfortable position. 
One Boeing eventually crashed down after my fifth attack. June 13, 1943. Today is the 13th. Our formation is attacking a group of 120 bombers. I see in the scope calmly moving Boeing. I press both throttles, and nothing happens. I check the magazine, the safety, pull the triggers again, and again nothing happens. Furious, I dive into the clouds. Today is the 13th, June 25, 1943. I feel wrecked after, along with the other pilots, sitting in the bar until dawn. There's a pile of empty bottles scattered about. There is a solid cloud cover in the sky. We're hoping on a day like this, the Yanks will leave us alone. Not a single enemy plane in sight. I lay down, hoping to get some sleep in the break room next to the staff quarters. The phone rang and woke me up at 7 o'clock. Enemy planes in the door door area. As if they couldn't have picked another day. The pilots were still asleep. I did not wake them up, but went to the airplane myself. The chief mechanic reported that all the machines were checked and ready for flight. Going into the canteen, I ordered an omelet, butter, bread, and tried to eat. The food seemed tasteless to me. For the first time, I felt no pleasure at the thought of going on a mission soon. Some kind of sudden weakness appeared in my stomach. Fear. No, I think it's not fear, but indifference. Even a visit to the restroom brings no relief. I run around the runway for 15 minutes, trying to pull myself together. Turret, my dog, runs beside me. Again and again he dashes forward, barking at the seagulls. From headquarters came the order to be ready for takeoff. The pilots, yawning, come out one by one. After having eaten a little, they put on fur boots, overalls, and life jackets. Some of them are talking to each other. I put my emergency rations and first aid kit in a roomy knee pad. We slowly made our way toward our planes. The alarm was expected at any moment. The mechanics are already at the planes. My chief mechanic is chattering his foot, sprawled out on the wing, chewing on a blade of grass. What an illustration of vigilance. Aren't 27 buckled his seatbelt? I put on my helmet. He handed me the telephone receiver. The commander is on the line. He asked if we're ready. The commanders answered in turn. Lieutenant Summer 28, me and Captain Falkenzamer 29. The enemy is approaching the coast. Apparently, today they are again headed for Wilhelmshaven. 8.11. Take off. The links take off one by one, a total of 44 aircraft. Shroud of clouds at an altitude of 2,000 meters. We climbed higher, approaching the coast. From time to time, we managed to catch a glimpse of the land through the breaks in the clouds. 5,000 meters. We passed through another cloud bank. 6,000 meters. No radio chatter. Only the location of enemy planes is reported. 7,000 meters. We expect the enemy to appear at any moment. I checked my weapon. The oxygen mask is too tight for me. I've made it more comfortable. We're flying through a cluster of cumulus clouds. A third layer of heavy clouds overhead. We're flying through valleys, caves, mountains in the clouds. Our planes seem incredibly small, overwhelmed by this splendor. There they are. The Boeings are about 1,000 meters below us. Today they are not flying in a tight formation, but one at a time, or three or four at a time, through a fabulous pelerine of clouds. One by one, we began to dive down. Let's go. The chase was on. Our attack has thrown the Americans into utter confusion. They're scrambling about, trying to hide in the clouds, to get away from us. It's impossible to estimate how many of them there are. They're like a disturbed bee's nest. We radio each other for favorable positions. Our pilots attack groups of Boeings in pairs. Today my wingman is a young surgeon flying with me for the first time. This is his first air combat. He has a great opportunity to win his first victory if he keeps his composure. I chose two bombers flying separately, wing to wing. We descended lower to attack them from the rear. Dolling, take the one on the left. I call out to the surgeon, but he moves away from me and moves to the right. 
ignoring my calls. Stay close to me, boy. The other way, to the left. Go left and attack. I opened fire at close range. The shells from my gun landed exactly in the center of the bomber's fuselage. The rear gunner persistently fired at me. I slowly approached, continuously firing. There were holes in my right wing. That bastard at the tail gun won't leave me alone, and apparently his nerves are ironclad. I shoot the Boeing at close range, concentrating on the tail gun. After my bursts, it went silent. There was an explosion, after which the overhead machine gun went silent. We were flying precisely in a deep canyon, with sheer walls of clouds on either side. It's an amazing sight. Delling is persistently flying to the right, not engaging. Why doesn't he attack the other one? Losing patience, I shouted, Shoot, you miserable jackass, shoot. He didn't react at all. I heard shells bursting. From the right side of me is machine gun fire from the second bomber. He's very close to me. Another gunner also starts firing at me with a twin machine gun. The lines go right over my head. I felt another hit on my plane. We hit a cluster of clouds. My Boeing already has a flaming tail and the left inner engine. But the two machine gunners from the second bomber continue to fire on me. They're only 30 meters away from me, trying to finish off my victim. This rascal will be shot down, even if I have to pay for it with my head. I stay 70 meters from his tail. The fire is spread to his right wing. For a moment, I let go of the wheel to get Delling's attention and point him toward the second bomber. Suddenly, there was a blaze before my eyes, and the hand I was waving flew back against the wall. I frantically grabbed the steering wheel, but immediately dropped it. My right glove, torn to shreds, is swollen with blood. I felt no pain. I grabbed the steering wheel again with my wounded hand, took aim and discharged the magazine into the enemy with a long burst. Boeing began to fall, burning like a torch 31. I followed him and escorted him to the sea, burning oil stain, all that remained of the heavy bomber. I felt a pain in my arm. I grabbed the steering wheel with my left hand. It was slippery with blood. My right hand is bleeding. Some time ago, I stopped realizing where I was, headed north, hoping to reach land. My engine miraculously survived. Lucky for me, the gunners on that Boeing were no good. The pain in my arm is getting worse. I'm losing a lot of blood. My jumpsuit looks like I'm lying in a pool of blood. How far from shore am I? The minutes stretch on endlessly, but I see no sign of this damned shore. I get some kind of strange fever, a sickly sensation. I think I'm losing consciousness. The pain in my arm is excruciating. An island looms up ahead, Norderney. In seven or eight minutes I can land. Time drags on interminably. Finally, I'm above Javer. Despite the throbbing pain in my arm, I began to descend slowly, shaking my wings in victory. The mechanics waved their arms and caps, cheering like children. Now I needed both hands to land. I clenched my teeth. My right arm was completely numb. My mechanic was horrified to see my arm and the blood running down my overalls. The other mechanics crowded around my plane. The commander is down. At the first aid station, the doctor on duty took the glove off my hand and applied a bandage, then gave me a prophylactic injection. It's only nine o'clock. The other planes didn't return until noon. We recorded two more victories. At noon, they took me to the hospital. It looks like they're going to operate. They've amputated a joint in my finger. My hand will be all right if it doesn't get gangrenous. The nurse has taken custody of me. I'm to stay here until further notice. I look out the window. My car is parked in the courtyard. Jung Meyer, my driver, is waiting for me. I cautiously looked around the long corridor. There's no one on the beach either. I can't stand the smell of a hospital. Half an hour later, I'm back at my airfield. I can't help laughing. They're probably out there looking for me. July 2, 1943. I wanted to stay with my comrades, but the squadron commander, Captain Specht, he took command of the squadron two months ago, ordered me to go on leave for a few days.
So I went with Lilo and little Ingrid to Hamel. Three and a half years had passed since I had left my hometown. At that time I had just entered the institute and wanted to become a soldier. Now I'm back as a senior lieutenant. I was promoted to the rank a month ago and confirmed as a squad leader. I was awarded the Iron Cross of the first and second degree. I have a black patch for injury, a pilot's badge. In the last few months I have in addition received a bronze, silver and gold wing badge for 200 combat sorties. In those days I had a youthful crush on Annalise, and now I am a married man, father of a family. Nothing has changed in my dear old town. They change my bandage every day. I walk around with my right arm in a bandage. Somehow proud of my first wound. I can't help myself. July 4, 1943. I still have almost a week of vacation left. But I realized that I missed the airfield, my comrades, my planes, and decided to return. Besides, I can't imagine my link without me. July 25, 1943. I received a sort of leather sheath to protect my bandaged arm, and now I can fly again with the aid of a strap tied to the helm. Over the past few days I have made many flights in a beautiful four-seat Messerschmitt Typhoon airplane. Right now I'm flying over Hamburg. The British by night and the Americans by day are conducting massive bombing raids and have practically destroyed this huge city. Whole neighborhoods lie in ruins in consequence of the night bombing with incendiary bombs carried out by the British. About 100,000 people are killed. The Americans are attacking military installations during the day. I see fires blazing on the ruins. Puffs of smoke rise to a height of 1,000 meters. The smoke spreads over an area of 20 kilometers, drifting slowly toward the Baltic Sea, 140 kilometers away. There is not a cloud in the sky. Huge columns of smoke rise into the azure sky. The horror of what is happening shook me. It's a horrible picture of human suffering. I immediately want to return to the battle, despite my wounded arm. July 27, 1943. During a test flight, I realized that I could fly my Gustav by tying my hand to the steering wheel. In the evening, I took to the air with the whole link for a training flight. Until my arm is not healed, I must avoid collisions with enemy fighters, but I can attack the bomber. Unfortunately, during this flight, Sergeant Kramer, just a few days after he was discharged from the hospital, fell into the sea. He had engine trouble. We saw him go down, but there was nothing we could do to help. The airplane disappeared forever into the depths of the North Sea. July 28, 1943. A cluster of enemy planes in the Dora Dora sector. That means a combat sortie. I tied my hand to the steering wheel and took off. At 8.35, we took to the air. Bombs attached under the fuselage. Over Heligoland, we rose above the approaching bombers and dropped our bombs. Below us, a terrific picture of a huge explosion appeared. The formation of tightly flying planes completely disorganized. Several Boeing began to fall sharply. The rest were thrown aside. They narrowly avoided collision. A bomb dropped by Sergeant Festus exploded in the very center of a group of three bombers. All of them simultaneously crashed and broke up. More than 20 parachutes opened in the sky. There were shouts of triumph in our headphones. It was unimaginable. We were flying over the defeated enemy in sheer excitement. It took a few minutes for us to calm down, to think. Johnny Fest was able to bring down three monsters with one bomb. Several other airplanes were damaged. I shouted to my guys. Now let's give them hell. We're going at the Yankees in formation. My guys are raring to go. I hear in my earphones. Let's go. Let's go. We got within striking distance. I've got a new plane, 30 millimeter cannon. My victim's fuselage has a huge hole in it. The pilot is panicking, trying to go down, hoping to escape. Five or six bombers, some of them on fire, have veered off to the side. Now we can shoot them down one by one. One by one they fall into the sea, burning like torches. Only flaming oil slicks remain on the surface. What a hunt! Having finished off one enemy, I went back to target another. 
Together with Shkit, Radatz, I fired on the Boeing until it caught fire. Radatz finished it off as it tried to escape by turning east. Suddenly I saw one of my comrades on fire. As I got closer, I saw that it was Sergeant Hefig. Take it easy, Hefig. Don't panic. Long tongues of flame shoot out from under the fuselage. Jump, Hefig, if you don't want to fry. I ordered the others to calm down. Kramer wouldn't have crashed yesterday if he hadn't lost his cool. Sergeant Hefig parachuted in. The air currents tossed him around. First he dropped like a stone, then his parachute opened. I saw him off, circling above him. Hefig waved his hand, then pointed downward. The sea was waiting for him there. I called the base. Younger brother shot down in the area of Ulrich Quell 6. He's falling into the sea, requesting assistance. The base confirmed the reception. They will find Hefig. He drifted slowly in the air until he fell into the water. Ten planes returned to base at 9.50 without damage. The mechanics carried us in their arms from the planes to the barracks. They were ecstatic. Arndt, my mechanic, congratulated me and for the sixth time gave me a ceremonial flower pot with the words, Every time I give this old pot as a gift, and I want it to save me money. There is unprecedented merriment at the airfield. Pilots tell the soldiers about the past battle. Today we have eleven more planes shot down. Eleven bombers will no longer bomb Hamburg. A rescue team fished out Hefig along with a company of his fellow Americans. In the evening, Hefig arrived from Heligoland, where he had been taken with the Americans. He was in fine spirits, unharmed save for a slight burn on his forehead. Yes, boys, what a great party, was all he could say in response to his comrades' congratulations. Johnny Fest, of course, is today's hero. He shot down three airplanes in one flight. We're getting calls from other units. They saw our fight and congratulate us on our success. I'm really proud of my fifth. I myself have the thirteenth on my record. This day will remain in our memory as a terrific shooting party. August 15, 1943. Once again my link, my five, received a special assignment. Under the wings of our airplanes, they installed something strange looking like a stovepipe. They were called stovepipes. In reality, they are launchers for mortar shells, or rather for rockets. They consist of a fuel compartment, an explosive compartment, and a timed fuse. It looks like our planes are about to be fitted with heavy artillery. Our job is to position ourselves 700 meters behind the enemy formation and use this clever thing to fire rockets. August 17, 1943. Early in the morning we were suddenly moved over the Rhine, 200 kilometers to the south. Massive attacks by American bombers are expected in central Germany. We should work in cooperation with air units stationed in that sector. But after only 90 minutes, we were given a new order to move to Gilsrin, in Holland. Several beautiful girls brought us food and entreated the pilots to a delightful breakfast right by the airplanes. The wide runway glistened in the hot sun. The Tawnies had treated it with bombs a few nights ago, when our night bombers landed here. I learned that Senior Lieutenant Geiger, an old comrade of mine from my days at the military academy, was also serving here. Immediately after my phone call he arrived. Outwardly he has changed a lot, I hardly recognized him, and he insists that I haven't changed a bit. Geiger is a night fighter commander who was awarded the Knight's Cross a few weeks ago. His character has not changed. The same honest Prussian, serious and persistent as before. At 13.15 the alarm was sounded. Geiger waved to me as I drove out onto the runway. Over Antwerp we met Boeings escorted by Spitfires. Because of my stovepipes, I am not allowed to engage them. I want to use them only in case of urgent need. Right now, we have to wait for the right opportunity to attack. I follow the Boeings, heading southwest in two groups, try not to get too close to them, and wait for the moment when the Spitfires fly back to England. Over Aachen, I got the opportunity to attack. But before I could fire, they punched through my left wing and blew off the tube. I could barely keep the airplane in line. 
There is a huge gaping hole in the left wing. I'm afraid there's damage to the spar. The heavy load could fracture the wing. I must avoid sudden maneuvers and try to fire the second tube. My pilots, meanwhile, have fired their rockets perfectly. Foreman and Fest hit once each. Their targets, bombers, exploded in midair. The rest of them shot unsuccessfully, as far as I could tell. My missile went through the center of the bomber formation, but didn't hit anyone. I turned around and went to land at Bonn, Hangler. Immediately I stopped by the repairmen. They confirmed my fears that my left wing spar was seriously damaged. This takes me out of the fight. They will put a new wing on my airplane overnight. I slowly wandered across the runway to the control tower. The Messerschmitts and Focke-Wolfs are returning from the battle. A total of 30 aircraft are now replenishing ammunition and fuel supplies. All of them are part of different air units. It is a pity that most of the pilots are inexperienced. There is not a single group commander among them. The Americans are again bombing ball-bearing factories in Schweinfurt. They passed overhead at a tremendous altitude, heading southeast. I am plagued by the thought that my airplane is unfit to fly. I decided to fly the damaged airplane no matter what. Ignoring the mechanic's prohibition, I loaded my ammunition and refueled. I gathered all the pilots on the airfield and told them that they were coming under my command. We took to the air together, the large compact group at 17.00. The Americans are already returning home at this time. I hope to give them a lot of trouble. I must treat my airplane like a basket full of eggs. We quickly climb to an altitude of 7,000 meters. There are about 150 Boeings flying in formation right in front of us. We are gradually approaching them. I send the pilots to attack one by one and myself, remaining slightly behind, chose a separately flying bomber. From a distance of 150 meters opened fire in short bursts. The Americans returned fire, their tracer shells whizzing around, very close above my head. These pearl necklaces are getting denser and denser. I think there is too much metal in the air. I find myself in a very disadvantageous position having to fly behind a group of bombers for several minutes without being able to attack. Anxiously, I look at the wing with the breach. Suddenly, my exhausted airplane is hit by a hail of fire. Despite this, the engine is running fine. I ducked, and it got a little easier. Approaching 100 meters to my victim, I slowly took aim. My plane shuddered from the impact. From the sound of it, the shell hit the fuselage, and I hit the target. The Yankees' plane was on fire, veering to the left of the main group. Five parachutes grew like mushrooms. Suddenly, several shells hit my plane in a row, and I was rocked. The sound was as if a sack of potatoes had been emptied into the empty barrel in which I was sitting. Flames rising from the engine. The smoke makes it hard to breathe, makes my eyes water. They got me after all. Damn it. I pushed the glass back to get more air. The smoke is getting thicker. Hot oil from the engine runs down the base of the wing. I made a wide turn, away from the cluster of airplanes. I enjoyed watching my Boeing crash into the Eiffel Mountains. A huge column of smoke billowed up from the pine forest. Wow! I turned off the ignition and fuel supply. The thermometer shows the radiator and oil temps are very high. Oh my God! My left fender is ruined. It could break at any moment. The flames are dying down. The fire has stopped. I activated the emergency release and opened the hatch. The rush of air took my breath away. The wind nearly ripped off my helmet and picked up the scarf around my neck. Should I jump? My Gustav has multiple breaches, but it's still flying. I stopped the propeller and began to plan. Heading east, losing altitude, the wind whistles over the wings and fuselage, and I'm drenched in sweat. Ahead was the Rhine River, a silver ribbon crossing a sun-dried field. The broad plain of the Rhineland blazes with heat. 4,000 meters. If I'm a little lucky, I can make it to Hangelar Airfield, near Bonn. 3,000 meters. I think I'm losing altitude too fast. 
A Messerschmitt 109 is not a glider. How's my engine? I turned on the ignition, leveled the roll, lowered the nose to increase forward speed. The engine rumbled and rattled, but it started. It worked. Not daring to increase speed, cautiously returned to an altitude of 4,000 meters. Again there was smoke and the smell of burning. Hurry to turn off the ignition and plan again. I won't make it to Hangular. I can't turn the engine back on. 2,000 meters, 1,500, 1,000. I notice something that looks like a large field and begin to descend. The ground is rushing towards me. I prepared to land on the fuselage by turning on the ignition again. The engine started. I need to make tighter circles to land on this field. Suddenly, the engine squealed, rumbled, and stopped altogether. That's it. The engine is silent. The propeller froze, as if it were clamped in a vise. The airplane grew heavy and out of control. Speeds dropping, left wings falling off. God damn it. I lowered the nose and regained control. The houses of the village glimmer below. My speedometer reads 500 kilometers per hour. I almost hit the tops of the tall trees. 400 kilometers per hour. I must land. 300 kilometers per hour. I'm hitting trees. The speedometer reads 250 kilometers per hour. I hit two or three wooden fences. The debris from the posts is scattered all over the place. Dust and clods of earth kicked up in the air. I touched the ground with my seat belt tightened and my feet on the steering pedals. A stone fence appeared ahead. God help me. Impact. There was dead silence. I loosened my seat belt and crawled out of the seat. My Gustav looked like an old bucket that had been kicked and trampled. All that's left of it is rubble. Nothing left but the tail landing gear. Blood oozes from my sleeve. August 18, 1943. Today the rescue plane of the Vey Squadron has been picking up downed pilots all day. We call it the flying garbage truck. My return to Javer at noon was greeted with loud shouts of joy. I still had shrapnel in my right arm. The doctor at Hangler extracted them last night. August 19, 1943. In the future, our airplanes will be equipped with additional fuel tanks to increase flight time. The squadron is tasked with combat missions in the center and south of Germany. Gustavs in my squadron have become clumsy and hard to control because of the heavy tubes and everything else loaded on them. September 27, 1943. Enemy planes spotted in the Dora Dora sector. It's time for takeoff again. 10.30. We are on standby. 10.45. Ready for takeoff. I got a new airplane. Aren't polished it until the machine shone like a mirror. So the speed of the plane will increase by a dozen kilometers per hour. 10.55. Signal for takeoff. As usual, the loudspeakers blare. All hands to take off. All hands to take off. The sky is completely covered with clouds. We rise above the clouds, at a height of 3,000 meters, and at the same moment we see Boeings right above us. We fly a parallel course to the east, at an altitude of 6,000 meters. Now they are not far from us. I ordered the pilots to dump the reserve tanks, although they are full. We swiftly went in for the attack, trying to get into a convenient position to fire missiles. When we had already reached the target, the Americans split into groups of 30 to 40 planes and began to change course from time to time. Wet tails against the background of clouds moved in zigzags. Approaching at a distance of 600 meters, I ordered to open fire from missiles. The next moment a fantastic picture opened before my eyes. Two of my missiles hit the Boeing. I saw a huge ball of fire. The airplane exploded in the air along with its terrible cargo. Blazing and smoking fragments began to fall down. Wenneker's also took a direct hit. His victim, engulfed in flames, collapsed to the ground. My wingman, she, Reinhardt, fired a rocket that exploded behind the Boeing. The bomber seems to have damage to its fuselage and turns left. I watch as Reinhardt rushed after him 
and firing all the machine guns nestled in the tail of the American. Suddenly, my attention was drawn to a strange, very fast airplane that appeared from behind two bombers. Who could it be? As far as I know, from our side in the operation involved only Messerschmitt and Fock Wolf. These strange planes are circling over the bombers. If they are German fighters, why are they not attacking the bombers? I climbed higher to get a good look at them. Good God, twelve or fourteen airplanes. The Yanks are coming with fighter escorts. I warned my comrades by radio. Since I couldn't attack the fighters alone, I went into a dive, descending toward the bombers. Suddenly four more strange single-engine planes swooped down behind me. They had a white star and wide white stripes on their wings. Damn it. They're thunderbolts. I've never seen them before. I dived for them immediately. They veered sharply to the left, heading for a lone Boeing with two external engines stopped. On his tail hangs a Messerschmitt. It's Reinhardt. The dummy sees only his prey and is unaware of the enemy fighters behind him. Reinhardt, Reinhardt, wake up. There are thunderbolts behind you. Reinhardt did not answer, continuing to shoot his victim. I went after the thunderbolts. One of them opened fire on my wingman. He kept firing at the bomber. Now the lead thunderbolt was in my sights. One burst from the machine gun is enough. It is engulfed in fire and has plummeted downward, entering a corkscrew. This is my second victory today. An explosion was heard in my plane. I turned around. It's a thunderbolt, right at my tail. It's joined by two more. I go into a steep dive, trying to hide in the clouds. Too late. My engine's on fire. I can feel the heat. Soon it becomes intolerable. Pulling back the hatch, I ripped the oxygen mask off my face, unhooked my seatbelt, and ejected. I was thrown out of the cockpit in an arc, tumbled over, and felt the wind press my jumpsuit against my body. I slowly pulled the retractor cable. When the parachute opened, I was thrown upward. After the rapid fall, I feel like I'm standing in the air. I'm rocking from side to side. The wide white dome of the parachute is swaying above me. The wind whistles in the slings. I get great pleasure from the flight. What a wonderful invention the parachute is, if only it would always open. Javer is to the north. I'm sure they can see me. If only they knew it was the shameful dangling commander of the five who had let himself be outsmarted by the thunderbolt. I landed in a field after running a few meters across it. The time is 11.26. It's only been 31 minutes since I've been in the air. Time enough for three airplanes to be shot down. I take comfort in the fact that the score is two to one in my favor. Arndt, my dedicated mechanic, watches me parachute back in. Sadness is written all over his face. This beautiful Gustav, he moans, shaking his head dejectedly. Today is indeed a black day for our squadron. In the evening, it turned out that of my Nellodes killed Sergeant Delling, shot down Radatz and Johnny Fest. Fest was wounded and is in the hospital at Emden. The 4th Squadron lost two pilots killed, one seriously wounded. One of the headquarters officer's planes also did not return. The 6th Squadron suffered the heaviest losses. Nine of the 12 pilots were killed. The remaining three made emergency landings or parachuted. None of the 12 airplanes did not return. In our asset can be recorded 12 shot down enemy aircraft as compensation for our losses. No less than six of them were shot down by my five. My personal account increased to 16. Heavy losses on our part can be explained by the fact that we did not expect to meet with fighters. We were taken by surprise. The nice thing is that today we prevented American bombers from reaching the target. They are forced to return with their bombs. The only exception was a small group of Boeings. They dropped their bombs through a gap in the clouds on the small town of Jessens in East Frisia. Hit a school 120 children killed. That's a third of all the children in the town. War has become ruthless. Such brutality was inevitable. October 2, 1943. We were transferred to Marks there, south of Jever, a huge military airfield with concrete runways. Our first sortie was unsuccessful. 
First, we could not catch up with the Boeings. They turned to the sea. Second, one of the pilots of the fourth unit crashed during a flight in bad weather. October 4, 1943. Since early this morning, our tracking stations have been reporting high activity in the air in Southeast England. The weather is good. Americans are expected to appear. Reports received so far, however, do not give a clear picture of what is going on. We are sitting on the airfield, near the hangars. Light music is coming from the loudspeakers. A senior non-commissioned officer approaches me with a folder full of papers. This damned paper war is driving me to exhaustion. I quickly go through the papers, stopping at the most important ones. Mentally, I'm far away, focusing on the upcoming fight with the Boeings. Turret runs down the runway, barking angrily at the seagulls coming in from the sea. Yesterday I took him to hunt rabbits. Turret is a fine hunting dog, quick, smart, and cheerful. Suddenly, the music on the loudspeaker stopped. Attention all units. Attention all units. Announces readiness for takeoff. Mechanics rushed to the planes. The pilots run after them. Turret sits on my left wing while I buckle my seatbelt and looks at me trustingly with his brown eyes. Ever since I brought him back from Norway, he jumps on the wing every time I get ready to take off. Only after the engine starts does the wind blow him off the wing. Then he chases the taking off airplane until it's out of sight. Arndt handed me a telephone receiver. The squad leaders report to Captain Specht. He explains the situation. The Americans are approaching North Holland from the sea. Today for the first time we are going to go into a frontal attack in a tight formation of the whole squadron. It's more than 40 airplanes. At 9.32 from the division headquarters came the order to take off. One link after another rises into the air, laying the left turn and adjusting to the main line of the squadron. Course 360 is the order from the base. We are gradually gaining altitude. The silence in the air is practically unbroken. At an altitude of 7,000 meters behind our aircraft begins to stretch a white trail. It's cold. Frost appears on the oxygen mask at my mouth and nose. Every now and then I slap myself hard on the thighs to keep warm. We see enemy planes, about 300 or 400 heavy bombers, far to the west. The commander sets a course toward them. In a few minutes we are already breaking into the line of enemy planes, firing all kinds of weapons. I'm at full speed rushing to the Liberator. Fire. I dive under its huge fuselage to avoid collision, moving along the right edge of the enemy formation. Going up, I make a left turn and come back to attack. I hit it. The bomber veered away from the main mass and flew back. No, my friend, this will not do. Where are you going? As soon as my liberator broke away from its fellows, I approached it from below and shot its fat belly until it caught fire. A liberator burns much faster than a more modern Boeing. Nine men parachute out. Their parachutes bob in the sky. The huge airplane is going down. I descend with it at a distance of 60 meters, sure that not a living soul is left there. I can clearly see huge holes from my shells on its nose and tail. Suddenly I notice a light on the upper machine gun. Too late. My engine's on fire. The airplane was out of control. It was time to open the hatch again, unbuckle my seatbelt. My engine stalled. The airplane nosedived, leveled out. It was like a huge hand threw me out of the cockpit. I don't remember how my parachute opened. I don't think I pulled the cord. A few hundred meters below me I see other parachutes. Me and the Americans would be swimming together. It seemed to me that the water jumped towards me. I quickly freed myself from the parachute. The water is cold, very cold and salty. I was picked up by a frothy wave and lifted upward. My life jacket inflated. I was on top of the wave, rolled over it, and was already on the other side going down into a deep green hole. My rubber boat was fine too. When it was half filled with air, the next wave almost ripped it out of my hands. In between the two waves, I managed to get into the rocking boat. The waves come one after the other. Each one is covered with hissing white foam. They cover me. I gasp and for a while I can't see anything. 
I am monotonously rocked up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. The water in my boat is coming in. I don't have time to scoop it out. I tore open my little paint bag and watched the water around me turn some unhealthy yellow-green color. My overalls gradually turned the same color. My comrade saw me fall. I am sure that help will come, if it were not for this cold and endless rocking. I looked at my watch. It had stopped. It's supposed to be waterproof. When I jumped, it felt like a pocket on my knee had ripped off. My emergency ration pack was missing, and my gun had fallen out of its holster. I unbuckled the belt with the flares attached to it and threw it away. What do I need this useless junk for now? The sky above me was scattered with airplane trails. The squadron's long gone east. I don't know how long I'll have to sit in a cold and salty bath. An airplane appeared from the south, heading in my direction. I waved my arms like crazy. They saw me. They're going to get me out of here. I don't want to be abandoned like a stray dog. It's a Fock Wolf, a Vey rescue plane. It passed very low above me. I could even see the pilots. They waved to me too and dropped some kind of package. As it fell into the water, it inflated. It was a life raft. As I was very eager to get this raft, I didn't notice another wave that almost threw me out of the boat. I swallowed water and almost suffocated. At the same time, another wave hit me. The water is intolerably salty. The fock wolf keeps circling above me. The raft is just ahead of me. I can easily swim to it. It took me a lot of labor to get on the tightly inflated raft. At last I collapsed on it in utter exhaustion. For about two hours I lay there, rocking in an endless rhythm, up and down, up and down. The silhouette of a rescue ship loomed. Strong hands lifted me to the deck. Saved. Wrapped in a warm blanket, I was transported to Heligoland, then the rescue service, Vey, took me back to Marx. October 5, 1943. All day long I have been tormented by a hangover. All night along with the pilots we celebrated someone's birthday. It was incredible. The room today looks like ruins after a battle. In the evening I took to the air with four airplanes to search for people missing at sea. Yesterday I was bobbing on the waves myself, and today we are looking for the survivors of the crew of a ship that sank yesterday after being blown up by a mine. There's a heavy fog on the sea. After an hour and a half of unsuccessful search, we return to the base. The sea has again taken its next victim. I was lucky to escape this fate. October 8, 1943. Today I made the following entry in my logbook. Date. October 8. Takeoff. 14.22. Marks. Landing. 15.21. Marks. Flight duration. 59 minutes. Notes. A group of bombers escorted by fighters intercepted in North Holland. One bomber is shot down south of Dollard. October 9, 1943. Having shot down my 18th airplane yesterday, I was forced to stop fighting the Boeings over Flensburg today. My propeller was damaged. It froze like a stiffener and I was forced to stop the engine and make an emergency landing at Westerland Island Airfield. October 10, 1943. The Yanks don't want to leave us alone. Today, they were actively attacking Munster. And as soon as we got into position to attack the Boeings, flying over the burning city, appeared Thunderbolts. A fierce battle broke out. Thunderbolts look made axe, but their clumsiness is compensated by high speed and maneuverability. But a Messerschmitt flown by a skillful pilot can overpower it. During the battle, I watched as Messerschmitt 110, one of the aircraft of the 76th Fighter Bomber Wing, fired four missiles at a group of Boeing. Two of them exploded in midair. After that, several thunderbolts rushed after the hero. Non-commissioned officers, Baron, Furman, and I rushed after them. After my first turn, one of the thunderbolts exploded right in front of me. Furman shot down another. After that, all the other thunderbolts started following us. We did everything we could to shake them off our tail. I did all the maneuvers I was capable of, and practically did a demonstration of aerobatics. 
Eventually, I got away from them by bringing the airplane into a vertical corkscrew. I knew that the Thunderbolt could not perform such a maneuver. Unfortunately, neither Baron nor Furman could follow my example. They are in a very difficult position, with ten or twelve Yanks hanging on their tails, while our fighter bombers have disappeared from sight. I went back down, firing indiscriminately to divert the pursuer's attention away from Baron and Foreman, and felt a strong jolt from a hit to the tail of my plane and to the left wing, where the landing gear is. Losing control, the airplane plummeted downward. I could not regain control of it. This incredible fall continued to an altitude of 1,000 meters. The situation is catastrophic. I was covered in cold sweat. My hands began to shake. Noke, I said to myself, this time, it's really the end. In utter despair, I tried to open the hatch, but it was jammed. I took my feet off the control pedals and kicked the hatch with all my might. Suddenly, the airplane shook violently so that I hit my head on the side porthole, and it leveled off. Baron came down with me, but was at a complete loss for words. At Twent, I landed the airplane on the fuselage next to the landing strip. Half of the tail and the right landing gear strut were missing. Soon a Fock Wolf showed up coming in for a landing. Its landing gear broke, and as soon as it touched the concrete, it flipped over and caught fire. The pilot was strapped into his seat and was burned alive before my eyes before he could free himself. I could not help him and was forced, barely restraining the trembling in my knees, to watch him burn under the wreckage of the airplane. A few minutes later, a hail of bombs dropped by heavy bombers at some distance from the airfield. I've had enough for today. November 17, 1943 On October 14, November 13 and 15, we went up to intercept heavy bombers over Rinland, but luck turned away from my link. Each time we encountered thunderbolts, mustings, and lightnings in fierce combat. This morning, three fighter pilots and three fighter bombers went to Achmer for an inspection parade. Reichsmarshal Goring appeared accompanied by a motorcade of 30 cars. I spoke to him for about 10 minutes when he was personally introduced to the Boeing specialists. I was fortunate enough to be the division leader. I shot down 15 bombers. Captain Specht, second, and senior Lieutenant Frey. Third, they shot down respectively 14 and 12 aircraft. Goring makes a very strange impression. He is dressed in some fancy uniform, his cap and epaulets decorated with gold galloons, full feet shoe in bright red suede boots. A glance at his flabby, puffy face gave the impression that he was ill. As I got closer, I realized he was wearing makeup. However, he has a pleasant voice and speaks to me very warmly. I know that he genuinely cares about the welfare of the pilots. Goring asked me about the enemy planes that I shot down. He was especially interested in the details of my first Mosquito, which I shot down a year ago. In his opinion, the mosquito was nothing more than a minor nuisance. He expressively repeated it again. A year ago, those two airplanes had particularly annoyed him, because at that moment he had begun to make an important speech and had to postpone it for two hours because of the raid. He personally presented me with the Gold Cross. The Reichsmarschall then addressed us on the difficulties involved in the defense of the Reich and the special difficulties we would face. To our surprise, he said that we pilots standing guard over the Reich were responsible for the failure of air defense in the West. He referred to the astounding efforts of the Royal Air Force pilots in the battle for Britain and called their courage a shining example for us. That part of his speech I agree with completely. But it seems to me that, in spite of everything, the commander of the German Air Force has a very vague idea of what happens when we face strong American air units. It is impossible not to admit that on the technical side of the flight data of our aircraft are below all estimation. After the victories in Poland and France, the top leadership of the German Air Force is simply resting on its laurels. The number of units standing in the defense of the Reich is completely inconsistent with the task at hand. The numerical superiority of the enemy at least 8 to 1. Success which was achieved against the background of crushing superiority of the enemy, 
We owe solely to the outstanding moral and fighting qualities of our pilots. We need more airplanes, better engines, and fewer staff rats. November 19, 1943 Yesterday, after an unsuccessful attempt to intercept approaching Yankee planes, we landed late in the afternoon at Street Trond in Belgium. The weather had turned bad. The sky over Holland and Belgium is covered with dense clouds. Snowstorms are rampant. Through the gaps in the clouds we climb to our combat altitude. At this altitude there is a danger of icing. The clouds below stretched like an endless white blanket stretching northward all the way to the sea. Our tireless Messerschmitts glisten, sparkling in the sun. From the engines of Daimler-Benz stretches a trail of exhaust across the cold and pale autumn sky. The oxygen masks take my breath away from the cold. We are heading north in a tight formation, just like a flock of cranes. From the base report the approach of a large number of Boeings from the sea, one of our planes. This is Furman, gradually lags behind the formation and loses altitude, as if exhausted from the long flight. To my inquiry over the radio, he replied that he was having engine trouble. In such gloom, having engine trouble is the only way out if life is precious. But the surgeon was lucky. His engine didn't stall, and after an hour of flying we turned back as the enemy bombers returned to their base. The thunderbolts would have shot his barely moving machine like a duck on a nest. Through a welcoming gap in the clouds, I led my formation into Street Trond. Eric Furman was the last to land, his airplane jerking along the tattered turf at the end of the landing strip. A light snow had begun to fall, quite unusual in these parts at this time of year. Before we could even warm ourselves by the stove in the mess hall, our airplanes were covered with a thick layer of snow and looked like petrified monsters from some fairy tale. An hour later, when Furman joined us, we were sitting around smoking glasses of rum punch. The engines of his airplane were already in good order. The trouble had been found in the compressor. By this time, we had started our usual game of cards and emptied several glasses of the strong, soul-warming drink. At first, Furman was reluctant to join the gambling, noisy company. He simply shrugged his shoulders and, raising his hand, rubbed his thumb against his index finger explaining with this gesture that he had no money. Someone forcibly sat him down in a chair. Someone else shoved in two five-franc coins. Many events played their part in Eric Furman's life, but at the end of his life, the strangest role was played by these two coins. Eric began to play and This had never happened before. He won. Furman raised his bet and won again. He continued to win with astonishing consistency. He took the pot, and won again. We were stunned. Several hours passed. Large clouds of blue tobacco smoke billowed under the low ceiling. Empty bottles and glasses were scattered on the floor. I looked at Furman. He had been assigned to our regiment a few months before and had become one of our comrades. The sky was his home. Like the rest of us, he felt like a fish in water there. For all its changeability, the sky gave us a chance to distance ourselves from the battle-torn fields of Europe over which we were flying. Like all of us, he fell in love with the life of a fighter pilot. The combination of the joy of flying and the exhilarating thrill of combat, because foremen shared our sense of patriotism, he became a good warrior and pilot. What I want to say to their mothers, they stayed in the clouds, our clouds that we know and love. Don't we long for them? exhausted in this crazy world. That object that sank in the swamp, the thing that was fished out of the sea, the mutilated remains on the rocky cliffs, they have nothing to do with our memory of Furman, Dieter, Dulling. Friends, don't you think they might die of laughter looking at our wistful faces? You could swear that that rascal Furman is just waiting for his next partner to play cards with him, said Johnny Fest. His humor is inimitable. It's unbearable, growled Baron. His motto, swearing is a laxative that relieves the soul. He had already written those words on his portrait, just in case this portrait joined the ones on the wall. December 11, 1943. On November 26 and 27 and December 1, we intercepted American fighters over the Ruhr and Rhineland. 
Today, my personal tally has reached 20 airplanes shot down. December 18, 1943. I have been offered a vacation for three days, but I can't leave now. The Americans are showing up every day. Yesterday, I was already sitting in the car that was to take me to the train when an alarm sounded from the loudspeakers. I jumped out of the car and rushed to my Gustav. My driver shook his head, and even Arndt said that I really needed to rest for a few days. At 3,000 meters, I have to give up the pursuit because my landing gear won't retract. Wenickers took command. They shot down two flying fortresses and a thunderbolt. It seems they can do without me after all. I'm leaving today. Jung Meyer drove me to the train station. Standing on the platform, I see the squadron going up to battle. I have seen them from the train window for a long time. For the first time in a year I am not with them. December 20, 1943. Lilo and I are back in Berlin. We plan to spend a few fun days here, visiting old friends, going to the opera, and plays. We hardly recognize Berlin. Everything has changed so much here. The city is flooded with hundreds and thousands of foreigners. Dutch, French, Danes, Belgians, Romanians, Bulgarians, Poles, Czechs, Norwegians, Greeks, Italians, Spaniards. Any of the European languages can be heard in crowded movie theaters, theaters, cabarets, restaurants, in the subway, on the streets. Everywhere, they displaced Berliners. Lilo and I couldn't find a place to sit down. This mix of languages and crowds of people swarming everywhere we go gets on my nerves. People live here as if there was no war in the world. Our life in war may be simple and primitive, but at least it is real. There is something that we soldiers have realized here, risking our lives every day in this deadly battle. It was a shock to me to discover that here in the city, people seek to satisfy only their own selfish desires for all sorts of revelry. This behavior is dictated entirely by the mentality of the civilian, not accepting the basic truths we are accustomed to there in war. I see the staff officers who serve in Berlin, clean, well-groomed, dressed in immaculate uniforms. I've lived in a different world for too long, and I've developed a different value system. The atmosphere of this place throws me off balance. December 22, 1943. Together with Ingrid, we went to visit my parents in Shiraz. Here, at home with my family, I began to feel some peace of mind. I harnessed my horse into a sleigh and set off on long journeys along the winter road on the banks of the Warda. Lilo and I are happy to be together. Ingrid is a beautiful little girl with curly curls. And I love it here. But even here I miss my comrades in the airfield, the smell of airplanes, and the sound of roaring engines. December 26, 1943. We are celebrating another Christmas. War still reigns on the ground. Early this morning came a telegram from squadron headquarters. Falcon Zamer killed. Sommer wounded. Specked. Squadron commander does not order me to directly end my leave and immediately return to the unit, but I realized how necessary to him now, when killed Captain Falcon Zamer, commander of the 4th Link, and wounded Senior Lieutenant Sommer, commander of the 6th Link. I am now the only Link commander ready for combat. Two hours after receiving the telegram, I left with the first train. Lilo understood me. She is brave. Such can only be the wife of a soldier. She waved at me and smiled when the train started. Will we meet again? December 27, 1943. I traveled all day and night. Jum Meyer met me at Wunsdorf. He delivered me to the airfield. The squadron was transferred here a few days ago. It is a well-equipped civilian airfield of the most modern design. I immediately reported my arrival to the squadron commander. Senior Lieutenant Noak has arrived from leave, Mr. Captain. Specht smiled, shaking my hand. I knew you wouldn't leave me, Noak. I really need you right now. He told me how Falcon Zimmer died. I took the death of that first-class officer very hard. Immaculate looking, tall, slender. He was beloved, his demeanor, his manners charming. He was from Vienna. Formerly in the Austrian Air Force,
His father was an officer of the Empire during the First World War. He has an utterly charming wife, whom Lilo and I had met in Jeber a few months ago. Falkenzamer was very tall and specked, who is now sitting across from me in his leather jumpsuit, is short. He is the smallest in the entire squadron, but every man who has interacted with him has felt his power. No other officer I have ever met has influenced me to such a degree. He is as strict with himself as he is with his subordinates, and expects them to support the Spartan methods of leadership to which he is committed. He lost an eye during a battle early in the war, but even with one eye, he looks like an eagle. Combat made him that way. The only things he could talk about were Boeings, Thunderbolts, Mustangs, and Lightnings. He once dragged me out of bed in the middle of the night just to discuss some tactical issues. Women were absolute evil to him. He forbade his officers to bring wives or girlfriends into the unit. If he spotted an airman with a prostitute, he disciplined him severely. In the last ten months, he shot down twenty bombers, and now he's ahead of me. His accuracy is truly uncanny. He is a very tough commander, and I have had many confrontations with him. A few weeks ago, he reprimanded me for the fact that several of my airmen had organized a party in a neighboring village with girls known for their easy attitude to morality. He ordered me to declare disciplinary action against my guys. I refused to carry out the order, saying, I can't do that, Mr. Captain. Then you're not worthy of commanding the link, he shouted, furious with rage. Then you'll have to find another commander for the five. I will relieve you of your command and deal with your pilots. I must remind you that in the last few months, which have been difficult for all of us, my pilots have shot down more airplanes than the other two units and your staff pilots combined. I know that Specht thinks very highly of my five, but such a reserved man would never admit it. Despite his irritable nature, I have a great deal of respect for him. Beyond any doubt, this is a great man. December 31, 1943 We had planned a party for New Year's Eve. At 5 p.m., however, Specht ordered that no officers, airmen, or personnel leave the barracks. Instead of a party, we had a holiday dinner in the officers' mess hall. Specht was never so scolded as after this order. When we entered the mess hall at 8 p.m., everyone was in high spirits. Several bottles had been emptied to forget our sorrows. Specht called us to silence and briefly explained the reason for his order. Gentlemen, I have received word from division that an important decision will be made today. Assuming that the maximum efficiency of our actions will be required, I have decided to forbid the traditional New Year's celebration. We will spend the remaining hours of the old year here together and go to bed immediately after midnight. He spoke in a sonorous, commanding voice. We preferred not to express what each of us thought about it. At exactly midnight came an important message from the division. Specht had been promoted to the rank of major. He was completely stunned because he was expecting some special combat assignment for the squadron. Under the chorus of congratulations, he immediately ordered the pilots to disperse. In a few minutes there was no one left in the room. January 1, 1944 My guys, appearing on the airfield, cannot open their eyes, suffering from a hangover. At night I heard them coming back from town. I have a splitting headache too. We hope the Yankees don't show up that day. 1944 got off to a smooth start. January 4, 1944. For almost a week, the Yankees have not been seen. Today they were spotted in the Dora Dora sector. At 10.02, the squadron went up for its first combat sortie of the year. Over Munster we came under fire from our own anti-aircraft gunners as we attacked a large group of Boeings. Coming in to attack one of the separate groups of bombers, I felt a direct hit to my airplane. The machine began to lurch toward the tail. The engine howled shrilly, then screeched and finally went silent. An anti-aircraft shell had knocked off my propeller, cowl, and the front of the engine. I couldn't regain control of the airplane. A second later, a thunderbolt dived at me, shot my wing, and it went up in flames. He didn't have a second opportunity to attack me, as Winnikers ended his career with a machine gun burst. 
Only by exerting all my strength do I maintain control of the airplane. We have to jump before the fire engulfs the entire plane. Open the hatch, unbuckle the seatbelt. I'm already doing these things automatically. I wasn't quite ready, but I jumped, and I stayed down. My parachute was stuck in the baggage compartment, which somehow opened. My right leg was already on the outside of the airplane, and my left leg was still in the cockpit. The airplane, falling apart, is hurtling faster and faster toward the ground. I can't move. The enormous force of the airflow presses me against the fuselage. My left leg hits the wall, almost breaking off. I scream in pain. The wind whips my cheeks and clamps my nostrils shut. It's so strong I can barely breathe. Tongues of flame are coming toward me. The airplane starts to shudder, then goes into a corkscrew, almost vertical. I can't even move my arms. They're pinned to the airplane. If I don't somehow manage to free myself from the airplane, I'm dead. I've got to unhook myself, unhook myself, unhook myself. The ground is coming up. With a last Herculean effort, after which my nose blood, I reached with my right foot to the steering wheel and pushed it. The airplane shuddered and for a moment hovered in the air. Losing speed, I was free. For a brief moment I flew alongside the airplane. Something with terrible force hit me in the back. It seemed that I was broken in half. After the second blow, to the head, I lost consciousness. I don't know what happened then. When I came to my senses, I was hanging in the clouds under a parachute dome. The extraction cable was in its socket. Probably the parachute had opened on its own. I wanted to inhale, but nothing came out. I tried to scream, but only an agonizing moan came out. Suddenly the ground appeared. The clouds are only 200 meters high. My parachute swayed from side to side. I flew just above the roof of the house and landed heavily on the hard, frozen ground. Then I lost consciousness again. I came to at the hospital. I was examined. Several x-rays were taken. Diagnosis. Skull fracture. Lumbar vertebra fracture. Shoulder and lumbar injuries. Wound on my right thigh. Concussion. Temporary paralysis of the right side caused by spinal cord injury. I'm nauseous all the time. The orderlies took me to a room with a huge window and put me on a brand new bed against the wall. The pain is excruciating, and I want to sleep. Today was supposed to be my last day of vacation with Lilo and little Ingrid. It wasn't until this evening that I became capable of coherent thought. In the bed across from me lies a senior lieutenant from the Bomber Air Force. We've met. He lost his right leg and left foot. His plane was shot down by a direct hit from an anti-aircraft shell in Russia. January 30, 1944. It had been 26 days since my airplane crashed. I could not endure confinement in the big hospital with its endless smell of disinfectants and asked to be transferred to the infirmary at Wonsdorf. Here at least I could be with my comrades. Every day I was moved to the back rooms where I could spend the whole day in a chair wrapped in heavy blankets. During these days our doctor's hair must have turned gray. Despite his strict prescriptions, I persisted in getting up and trying to walk. At first my paralyzed legs caused me much suffering. Then things began to improve day by day. By now I was used to the incessant headache. This morning came the order to move to Holland. We're to arrive at the base in Arnhem to counter heavy bombers. I waddled on crutches to my Gustav and joined the others. Specht was surprised but not annoyed to see me when I reported to him after landing. At 13.05 we took to the air again. We were immediately attacked by Spitfires that suddenly appeared out of the clouds. They took us by surprise, so we could not organize an effective resistance. They hunted us down like crazy. It was one of those cases where it was every man for himself. I never had a chance to fire. We suffered heavy casualties. Not far from Hilversum, a shell hit my engine, and the engine stopped. I was lucky that I was able to make an emergency landing two kilometers from the airfield. Specht is the only one who managed to shoot down a Spitfire. The fourth wing lost five men killed. The sixth wing lost three. Headquarters lost one. 
I lost Esch, Novotny, who had arrived only a few weeks before in my squadron. Seat. Radatz was also shot down over Hilversum, where he landed after his plane's tail was shot off. He and I flew to Wunsdorf together, in a KL-35. February 10, 1944. Enemy planes in the Doradora sector. A tracking station reported. At 10.38, we're taking off. Climbed to 8,000 meters above the Rhine. Came the order. Specked is ill, and I'm temporarily in command. At 8,000 meters above Lake Dummercy, we saw the enemy. The picture before us was, without exaggeration, awe-inspiring. We saw about 1,000 heavy bombers heading eastward, accompanied by a powerful escort of fighters. Until now I had never seen such a mighty air armada. They were clearly heading for Berlin. Together with the fighters I counted 1,200 American airplanes. We have 40 planes, but even if there were only two of us, we would have to engage. I chose a group of Boeings flying on the left flank of the general formation and converged for a frontal attack. The Americans had obviously figured out my intention. At the decisive moment, they smoothly changed course, so my maneuver was in vain. A right turn and a wide turn. I waited until we were ahead of the Americans, turned around and went for a second frontal attack. With my 40 Messerschmitts, I was going to clash with the enemy formation. On the radio, I ordered the pilots to remain calm and save ammunition. We closed formation. I noticed the thunderbolts behind us. They won't be able to stop us in time. Radatz flies next to me, wing to wing. He waved at me a second before we opened fire on the Yanks. As I was looking for my target and taking aim, something flashed on the neighboring plane. Radatz began to go down immediately. I could not follow him as I was firing at my target. I continued to close in on my Boeing, firing with the cockpit, until I soared upward to avoid collision. My volley hit its target. The Boeing rocked. Panicked bombers darted away. Then my victim's wing broke off, and the huge plane plummeted downward. Losing control, it entered its final dive to crash at an altitude of 1,500 to 3,000 meters. More than 10 other bombers were shot down. Finding myself alone, I found myself being pounced upon by eight Mustangs. The pilots were clearly inexperienced. After a few sharp turns and loops, I dodged them and soon found myself on the tail of one of them. But just as I'm about to open fire, I'm surrounded by several thunderbolts. I am forced to dodge and rise in a vertical corkscrew. This maneuver has always saved me. No enemy managed to follow me. For about half an hour, I tried to get into a convenient position to fire at the Mustang or Lightning, but without success. Finally, I got to the tail of a group of Boeings and opened fire. But before I could see the results of my salvo, I was attacked by two thunderbolts. Both airplanes had black and white squares painted on their hoods in the shape of a checkerboard. Entering a steep dive, I disappeared into the clouds. At 11.41 I landed again at Wunsdorf. There I learned that Radatz had been killed. This is a very heavy blow to our unit. Radatz had been with us since the squadron was formed. I've never met a more talented pilot. He was the best of us. I can't believe he's gone.